Open your copy of the Word of God to the last book in the New Testament, Revelation chapter 1. We're going to be taking a story that's found in Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 through 20 this morning. When I read this story, it reminded me of an experience that I had when we were visiting Oregon last. We were on the Oregon coast, and when we're on the Oregon coast, I always like to get up every morning and then take a walk, a good long walk along the ocean or in the mountains, and my knees are kind of bad. It it makes it difficult because when you're walking along the ocean or in in a mountain vista like that, you want to walk extra far and extra long, but it's kind of hard on your knees. So when I got done with my walk, on that particular day, I was in a place called Cannon Beach, Oregon. You've probably seen pictures of it. It has that famous haystack rock out in the water. And Cannon Beach is a beautiful beach town. And I, I got in my car and I was driving back through the house, through the houses built along the beach there. And I saw a man walking out to a working van. And, the, and by, by the looks of it, the man was older than I. And I noticed that he walked kind of slow. And I noticed that he had pads on his knees. And I noticed that the van said carpet installation. And I thought to myself, how hard would it be to be an old man and to have to work on your knees like that all the time? Well, this story that we're going to read today is about an old man, and he's in a very hard place in the story. You want to arrange the message around the story, but but seven questions and answers. I'm going to ask and answer these seven questions. Who is John, the man in the story? And and number two, what did he hear? And number three, what did he see? And number four, what did he do? And number five, what did Jesus do when he did what he did? And number six, what did that mean to John's readers? And number seven, why does that matter to us? And then after we're done with those seven questions and answers, we'll all go eat lunch. Is it a deal? Not together, just somewhere. So the first question is, who is this man, John? And we're going to read the text. It's John chapter 1 and and verse 9. And just see if you can listen for the answers as we read through this beautiful, amazing, spectacular story of the Bible. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning... I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his hand... He held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So who is John? Question number one. Where is he? What's he doing? Well, this is John the Apostle who calls himself in this text a brother, a companion in tribulation and in the kingdom. And in the text, he appeals for patience. In John 16, 33, John the Apostle wrote in his gospel, in the world you will have tribulation. And Peter, Paul was right preaching in Acts 14 and said, it's through many tribulations we enter the kingdom of God. 
There are key themes in Revelation. One of the key themes is tribulation. One of the key th themes is kingdom. In between is patience so that we have the victory. These are all repeated key themes in Revelation. This is what John says right from the beginning. I'm your brother. I'm your companion in tribulation. We're making our way toward the kingdom. We want to have patience. He puts a lot in that little, in, in that little phrase. Tertullian, a church father, wrote that the Apostle John had miraculously survived being dropped into boiling oil in front of a large number of people who recognized that as miraculous and were, many were converted. And then the emperor, uh, uh, Domitian, exiled him to Patmos, which was a rocky island 60 miles off of the coast in the Mediterranean in the Aegean Sea and probably a penal colony. Tim Keller once said, he said, some of you will attend the funerals of all your other family members. John must have felt this way because John's brother, James, had been beheaded. His fellow apostles had probably at this point all been martyred. martyred. Stephen had been publicly stoned to death. Paul had been beheaded in Rome 30 years earlier than this. And so John was probably an aged man and the last living apostle. John Wolverd, a Bible scholar, wrote, according to Victorious, another of the church fathers, John the aged was forced to labor in mines on Patmos. It was a Sunday, some say then it was a penal colony. John then, if you think about this, was an elderly man who had been with Jesus and he'd seen his miracles and he'd experienced his ministry and he'd had a fruitful ministry, but now he was in a very, very hard place. He was suffering. He was enduring physical suffering. He was enduring emotional suffering. This had to have been a spiritual challenge for anybody. John was working the rock pile. And he must have wondered, Lord, I love you. And I know you love me. But why am I here at this point in my life, isolated from people, working this rock pile? Have you ever had a rock pile season in your life? A season when things were hard, like the young mom who wonders if she's ever going to get ahead of all the work that she has, or maybe the middle-aged woman who wonders if it was really worth doing all the things that she had to do for people that she's not really sure appreciated it. It's kind of a, like work in the rock pile. Or the man who gets off in his car every day and he goes off and he does again and again and again what he does again and again. And he's just barely staying ahead of the bills. And he's really not sure anybody really cares that much. He's just working the rock pile. You have a rock pile in your life? Some of you I know have problems that are never going to go away. They're hard. They're difficult. You have children that need constant attention. And yes, it's a blessing, but it's also hard. It's also very hard. And it never lets up. It never stops. It'd be easy at a time like that to say, Lord... Why am I working this rock pile? Where are you? Why am I here? I think about unmarried men or unmarried women, some of whom are happily unmarried or men or women. Others are like, well, they could imagine not being so lonely. And they wonder, why, Lord, am I here working this rock pile? Or for some, it's just our, our sins that kind of get their hooks in us, right? Get their talons in us and we struggle to relieve ourselves of that. It's, it's like work on the rock pile. And there's emotional suffering, and there's, sometimes there's physical suffering. But there's always that spiritual challenge. And we ask ourselves, why am I here? I feel like I'm just pounding rocks every day. John must have felt that way. And John, God put John into a spiritual trance. He had a vision. In this text, it's, he says it like this. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. John Wolver, the scholar, says that the Lord's Day is probably a reference to John in this trance seeing forward to the day of the Lord. But he said he was in the Spirit. And John uses this only four times in Revelation, and he always uses it in a technical sense. It means something very specific. As a matter of fact, I think we have a little slide here that shows the four times in Revelation that, uh, let's go to the next slide, I'm sorry, that John has visions in the Spirit. And the first vision that he had was the one we're talking about here in Revelation 1 and verses 10. And it's the vision of the Son of Man. And then John has another vision in the Spirit in Revelation 4 and verse 2. 
And this is where John watches events unfold from a heavenly throne room. Literally, they're, they're, a scroll is rolling out, and he's seeing history roll itself out. He has a vision of this, and he writes it down. And then in Revelation 17 and verse 3, there's another section where John is in the Spirit, and this is where he's watching events unfold out of an earthly wilderness. And finally, in the very end, kind of the ultimate end of the universe, John has a vision in the Spirit in Revelation 21 and verse 10. And John here, in this beautiful vision, is inspecting the new Jerusalem from a high mountain on the new earth. As we study, and if we study through the whole book of Revelation, you'll see these as key points to understand the book of Revelation. You just want to understand these four visions that God gave John in the Spirit. Let's go to the second question. What did John hear? What did John hear? In verses 10, the second part of verse 10 and verse 11, it says, he heard a loud voice like a trumpet. You see that? Verse 10, a loud voice like a trumpet. Here's what it says. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. These were seven literal churches. Let's go back up to the little slide. We're going to back up a couple there. And there's a little slide which would be a little difficult for you to see. But as you can see, there, is a, there was a, um, a postal route here. And Ephesus would have been kind of the mother church. And these other churches have been planted around this area about 60 miles from each other. And it would have been common for them to travel this route. And this is the route that they traveled in visiting these churches. And there were messengers from the churches, whether they were pastors. Some say the reference to messenger it says angels it could mean human messengers it could be pastors it could be representatives of the churches and god says to john i want you to write down what you see i want you to send it as letters to the churches i want the churches to have i want them to hear what you're going to see today and 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 of course um he's out here on the isle of patmos and so um he he says to write it down in in a book and not a folio book like we would have uh but a scroll like a papyrus. And, and these churches then would be receive this. So that's what John heard. He heard this voice. Then the Bible says in verse 12, he turned around and we answered the question, what did John see? Now John had a sensational vision here. Verse 12, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the lampstands, one like the son of man, clothed with a long robe, a golden sash, etc. We'll get into that. What did he see? So he saw this sensational vision. Here's what I've noticed as a pastor over 40 years, that two extremes are common in the modern church when we get into the prophetic literature of the Bible, and there's a lot of prophetic literature of the Bible. One extreme is just to ignore it, just to set it aside, to consider it a bit confusing. And so many, many times you'll notice that these passages are just kind of skirted around Others, however, you know, use them to sell books and tapes. Uh, they're sensationalistic, right? There's a sensationalism about it, and there's a speculation about it. I've seen and had books given to me, for instance, on that 9-11 predict, was predicted in Isaiah. It wasn't, but there's a book about that. Or I, I was given a book that America is Babylon, and we're not talking about like Babylon, but Babylon, this is not true. Or uh, maybe you heard this, that there was a hole drilled to the center of the earth, and recording, recordings were made of screaming, tormented souls in hell. Speculative stuff, right? Or secret preparations are being made uh, in Israel to rebuild the temple and to resume its services, and someone has the ashes of the red heifer somewhere, and stuff like that. The Ark of the Covenant. Um, there is a big flourish of interest a couple years ago about blood moons and the significance of blood moons. It's speculation. It's sensationalism. It goes beyond what the scriptures plainly teach, but it sells books and tapes. I'm sure not everybody's insincere when they're teaching this. The Jewish feast days, though, and the Jewish festivals no longer have any relevance to us since Jesus came. Christians are dwelling on blood moons when they should be dwelling on the Son of Righteousness. Today, some will frequently tell me that I need to preach in support of Donald Trump. Others will regularly charge me with neglect for not preaching against Donald Trump. When I was a boy, preachers often yielded to the temptation to preach against communism. One Saturday night, an attorney called me in a former church, and he demanded that I set aside my message for the day and that I speak on ISIS in the morning, he said. I said to him, I'm thinking about preaching the gospel in the morning, but he didn't want to hear the gospel. 
<laughs> he wanted to hear about ISIS. A man named Edgar Wisenhunt said the rapture will happen in 1988. If it happened, I missed it. Harold Camping said the rapture was going to happen May 21, 2011. Again, that didn't happen. So there, these are highly sensational and profoundly speculative things. And I could have lengthened the list five times longer than that. Sensational prophecy headlines do sell books and tapes. But they also leave people frustrated. They leave people disillusioned. They leave people cynical. And they leave people with their confidence in the Bible shattered. But here we have, in the Bible, a sensational and spectacular vision. So let me suggest something that should resonate with you. Today, we're dealing with a story about a vision that John had on the island of Patmos. And this story is one of the two most sensational visions in all of the Bible. The other one is in this book, in chapter 19, when the king of kings returns to the earth. Now that is sensational, but it's not speculative. So we should be stirred, and we should be moved to worship at a vision of Jesus given to us. We should need no other spectacular vision. Whatever it is you're going through, whatever rock pile you're working, whatever question that you have, whatever doubt you have, can I, I want to suggest to you that you need a vision of the Son of Man. If you feel like your life is boring and mundane, you need a vision of the Son of Man. If you're confused about what you ought to do with your life, you need a vision of the Son of Man. If things are hard for you and difficult, just a vision of the Son of Man. And this is what John was given to write down, to put in a scroll, to give to the churches. They needed a vision of the Son of Man. And the, and, and the message was victory is ours through the risen, conquering Jesus. And we're told not to speculate, not to calculate, but we're told to worship and work and witness and, and to be hopeful and to be holy. Let's be honest. When Christians approach the book of Revelation, you know this, there are differing interpretations. In the room, I'm sure, there are some differing interpretations. And even if we end up with different ideas about the timing of the rapture here, or even if we did differ about what the kingdom looks like, the main point of this book is plain, and that is Jesus is alive, he's the risen conquering king, and he's coming back to earth someday. And that ought to orient your life right there. What does this symbolic description of Jesus mean, though? Because it's laden with interesting uh, symbols. The lampstand and the stars, are the, they're, they're decoded in the text. But the, the other symbols that are given in this vision of the Son of Man, they should be seen initially in a very poetic way. Anybody reading this would just say, I'm not sure what it means, but it's something awesome. The Son of Man is something awesome. Anybody would see that. But let's go through, through this a bit, like, just read it again, and then work our way through it briefly. I turned to see the voice that was speaking, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. I'm in verse 13. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man. This phrase, the Son of Man, anybody who is familiar with the Old Testament and the writer of Revelation assumed the listener was familiar with the Old Testament would recognize this is a designation given to the one who appears in Daniel chapter 7. The Ancient of Days, the Son of Man. And Jesus' favorite thing to call himself was the Son of Man. And so it says here, In the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. His voice was like the roar of many waters. His right hand he held seven stars, and his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. This is a spectacular vision, and we don't want to rush immediately to decode it. We want to stand back in awe and just say, this is an amazing vision of Jesus. But think about this for a minute. He's among the golden lampstands, which are identified then, of course, as churches. And churches are charged with being the light of the world. He's one like the Son of Man, which is evidence of his eternity. Go through the slides here as I read this. Uh, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13. The Gospels are a picture of Jesus in his humiliation. But Revelation is a picture of Jesus in his glory. He is the Ancient of Days. And so you have the eternity of the one like the Son of Man. And then you have the dignity of one clothed in a long garment like the dignity of a high priest or prophet. And so this Jesus that is, appears in a vision has eternity. 
has dignity. He has majesty. And he's girded about the chest with a golden band. A judge wore a girdle or, a go, or a, over from his shoulder across his chest with an insignia of the magisterial office that he held. Deity shown in his head and hair being white like the ancient of days, symbolic of wisdom, omniscience, and judgment. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His insight was penetrating, was all searching. This was the symbolic of his omniscience, that he knows everything. His feet were like fine brass refined in a furnace. His sovereignty, power over his opponents. His superiority is shown in a voice like the sound of many waters, like a waterfall or like a thundering surf. When he speaks, you can't ignore it. He's superior. His, his vigilance is shown by the seven stars in his right hand. It is interesting, in the first century, Domitian the emperor had a coin made when his son died, and the coin was of his son, and in, the, and in his hand were seven stars. And God gave John a vision of the Son of Man who had seven stars in his right hand. This not, would not have been lost on the people who were starting to be oppressed by Domitian. Then there was evidence of his authority and the sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. What this man utters happens. And then finally, his countenance was shining like the light of the sun. This was symbolic of his glory. Now this is a vivid picture of Jesus in his glory. Now I like Mr. Rogers, but Jesus is not Mr. Rogers with a, with a beard and sandals. He's the son of man. He's coming in power. He's the king of kings. This is reality. This is reality. Jesus is a true living being and he's alive. And this is the picture that we get of him. So now when John saw this picture, what did he do? What did he do? Look in John, look in, in, in Revelation 1 now in verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. When John saw this, he fell down like he was dead. That's what the Bible says. It was the appropriate posture toward God when we see him in his glory. Who am I, God? I should stand before you. Something happens in a woman's life when she first really sees who Jesus is. Something happens, powerful, transformative, life-changing happens when a young man has a vision of who Jesus really is. When you get a portrait, a true and genuine portrait of who Jesus really is, then the day star rises in your heart and you are forever changed, forever transformed. My grandfather, his name was Kenneth. He was a farmer and he was raised in a country church and he came to believe as a little boy, but he drifted away from the Lord and he didn't walk with the Lord and his faith was little more than a religious duty that he performed. Until my, grandpa, until my father, until my dad, went in the Navy and some, some aggressive Baptist evangelist led my dad to the Lord. And my dad had a vision of the Son of Man. And when my dad went home and he began to explain to my grandpa about how he'd come to know Jesus, shortly thereafter, my grandmother and my grandfather had a vision of Jesus. They understood who Jesus was in a very powerful way. What's interesting is that when my grandfather really came to know the Lord, it profoundly changed his life. He told me a story once about an autumn night when he was trying to decide if he would fully devote himself to Jesus Christ. He was driving through the Ohio countryside, the rolling hills of Ohio that he loved. And he's thinking about some loyalties that he had, some organizations that he was in, some things that he was committed to. And he felt like God was saying to him, I want you to follow me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I want you to do whatever I want you to do, and I want you to go wherever I want you to go. And my grandfather said he pulled his car off the side of the road, and he walked out into a cornfield. On his hand, he had a ring that signified an organization that for years our family had been involved in. And he decided that God wanted him to take that ring off and throw that ring off into the night and then be, follow Jesus with all his heart. Shortly after that, my grandfather became a pastor when he was 55 years old. I got a letter last week from a distant cousin of my dad's who had read one of my books. And she said, I wanted you to know that I knew your great-grandmother, Lily. This would be my grandfather, Kenneth's mother, Lily. She said, I knew Lily. Lily always talked about a vision she had of her 
son, Kenny, being a pastor. But when your dad became a pastor, she said, well, my vision must have been wrong. It must have been my grandson that was going to be a pastor. And then she died. And then my grandfather became a pastor. And the vision that she had about her son being a pastor was fulfilled. And my grandfather was a pastor for 17 years until he died. But my grandfather couldn't just go along with a bit of religion tacked onto his life. He had to have a vision of Jesus, who he really was. It won't be enough for you to go to church with your parents. It won't be enough for you to make your wife happy by going to church with her. You shouldn't go to church just to kind of like, kind of appease God and get that out of your way and then go on with your life. You need a vision of the Son of Man. You need to know that Jesus is alive. You need to know that Jesus is the King. You need to know that Jesus is coming back someday to judge the living and the dead. And he'll have his saints with him. And the question always ought to be on your heart, will I be with him? Do I know him? John fell at his feet. We all need to have that experience. Question number five, what did Jesus do when John fell at his feet? Well, Jesus put his right hand on him and he spoke words of comfort and encouragement to him. I like to say that's because Jesus knew his love language was words of affirmation and physical touch. <laughs> but that probably wasn't it. This is amazing that I'm in a room of 300 people. I'm the only person who thought that was funny. Right? <laughs> so that's because you guys think the love languages is one of the epistles in the Bible. and It's not. But uh, Jesus put a hand on him. He tenderly touched him. And he spoke and said to him what? Don't be afraid. Here's the king of glory who could have instantly vaporized this sinful man. But he was the disciple that he loved. And there on the rock pile that day, Jesus reached down and touched him and said, you don't need to be afraid. Basically, he says, do you like what you see? Good. Write it down. Send it to the churches. Tell them I was dead and now I'm alive. Do you understand the significance of that? Well, Jesus, Jesus was displayed to John in his humility. And then John saw Jesus mistreated. And John saw uh, Jesus disrespected. And John saw Jesus tortured. And John watched Jesus crucified and buried. And then rose again. And yet now he has a vision of Jesus in his resurrected power. In his full display of his glory. He says, I died and now I'm alive. I conquered death. He says, I am alive and I'm never going to die again forevermore. Raised not to old life, but to new life. And then he said, I have the keys. I have the total authority over death and the grave. I have the keys. I own this. John, don't be afraid. And then he says, write this down. Now John would not have had writer's block, would he? He would have gone to writing and, oh, do I have a vision to tell the churches? And imagine the pastors or the messengers or the angels or whatever they are of the churches coming. And John says, look, I've got something you're going to want to tell the people. I know they are all on their own rock piles. And I know that Domitian is threatening them. And I know that some of them, their families have rejected them. I know that some of them really wonder if everything that Jesus said is true since he died. I have a letter for you. Take it to the churches. They're going to be so encouraged when they read this powerful vision of Jesus. And so these messengers were in the right hand of Jesus. And he is walking among the churches. And he's walking among the rocks as well. Number six. What did this then mean to the original writers? And I've hinted at that. What was God's message to the original audience here? Jesus is alive, and he's among the churches, and he's defeated death, and the churches are expected to radiate light, and they're accountable to Christ, and they'll answer to Christ. They didn't see this vision. John saw the vision. Like you and I, they read a report of the vision that John saw. And God honors the faith of those who read the report and who believe it. Though we don't have the vision of the Son of Man, we read about the vision of the Son of Man the day star rises in our hearts, we act in faith, and God, Jesus, is walking among the candlesticks, walking among the lampstands, walking among us, walking in our rock pile, if you will, is there to comfort us, there to encourage us, there to hold us accountable. He's real every day. And so the Son of Man is among the churches, and Christ appears resplendent in overpowering glory to reassure his churches that by his death and resurrection, he has the control of the danger and the death that threaten them. And although he's exalted in heaven, he's also present with the churches on earth. And he knows their needs better than they know their own needs. So 
that brings us to the final question, and that is, why would this matter to us? Why did God preserve this down through the ages in holy writ so the people of Bethel would open their Bibles in their laps this morning? What does it mean to a 14-year-old boy here today? What does it mean to a wife who's discouraged? What does it mean to a man who's kind of going through a season of time in his life? What does it mean to a person who's alone? What does it mean to a person who's under-resourced and wonders where their money is going to come from? Jesus is in the rock pile. Jesus is walking among the rocks. And Jesus is walking among the lampstands and the churches. And he's with you. He's with you. You you know this. I'll always tell this story over and over again. But I had a season before I came here that was the saddest season in my life. And during that season, I didn't have a church And so I got in my red Jeep, and I drove away to wherever anyone wanted me to preach. But the experience that I had was I was never alone in that Jeep. It was such a sad time. But when I turned the key of that red Jeep and drove, I sensed the presence of the Lord with me. I don't know what you're going through. Or, 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 you know, maybe you can't even tell anybody. Some of the hardest things in your life, you can't even talk to anybody about them. Sometimes they're your fault. Sometimes they're not. But for many of us, we have things that we live with constantly. And we just have a sense about those things that it's not fair. It's not just. It's not right. It's not the way it should be. You shouldn't have been treated that way. That shouldn't have happened to you. It's like you're working a rock pile. I want you to know today, you're not alone. Jesus is with you. There were so many times in my red Jeep that I went to turn on my radio. And I thought, no, I'm going to not turn on my radio because... I'm not alone. Jesus is with me. And there was a powerful joy and a sense of Jesus being with you. Call it a sense of the presence of the Lord. And and, and that will be all that you need. What do you need when you're confronted with death? What do you need when you're confronted with disease or cancer or persecution or tribulation? Can I just say, you need what God gave John. You need a picture of how beautiful, how powerful, how sovereign, how wonderful how dignified, how godly Jesus is. Don't be afraid. Tremble before the Son of Man, and you don't need to tremble before anybody else. Don't be intimidated by death. Jesus has the keys of death and of hell. Don't be seduced or intimidated by the world around you, pressured into what, because it hates and ignores the Son of Man. If we have the kingdom of God in our hearts, we don't need to be seduced. And we don't need to be intimidated by the saber rattling of the kingdoms around us. Or the people who don't know the Lord. Or the people that are ignorant. They're going to face God someday. Don't let the, the, the monotony of the rock pile that you're working fool you. Jesus is with you. You're doing something that matters. Jesus is with you walking among the rocks. Don't tremble before your troubles. Let your troubles tremble before your king. And look up from the rock pile. When Isaiah looked up from the rock pile, and from his sorrow, and from his guilt, and from his insecurity, do you remember in Isaiah, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And then he said, here am I, Lord, send me. Stephen looked up from his persecution, his execution. He saw Jesus on the throne and was received to to heaven. Paul looked up from his trials, and from his burdens, and from his captivity, and from his thorn in the flesh. And he saw visions in heaven. Daniel looked up from Babylonian captivity and from abuse and mistreatment. And he saw a vision of the Son of Man in the Ancient of Days that scholars still study and preachers still preach and old ladies still take and weave into their prayer lives. John looked up from the rock pile and he saw the risen conquering king. So you look up from the rock pile. You look up at his eternity. He's the son of man, the ancient of days. You look up at his dignity. He has a long regal garment. You look up at his majesty. He has a golden band across his chest. You look up at his deity. He has hair white as snow. At his omniscience, his eyes are like fire. At his sovereignty, he has feet like brass. At his superiority, he has a voice like thunder. At his vigilance, he has seven stars in his right hand. As authority, he has a sword coming out of his mouth. And what he says happens at his glory. He has a face that shines like the sun. You getting the picture here? This should be the thing that you see over every other thing you see. The rock pile is temporary. Domitian himself is temporary. Anything against him, anything that opposes him is weak and temporary. He's the eternal son of God. And he is about to unroll history. And he's about to come and rule and make everything right. Suetonius has told us that Domitian, quote, became an object of terror and hatred to all. But at the last, 
He was overthrown by a conspiracy of his friends and favorite freedmen, to which his wife was also privy. Domitian tried to take unto himself titles that belonged rightly to Jesus, Lord and God and Savior. Domitian, by worldly standards, had everything. He, was, he sought to keep his life and make himself God. But he lost everything. In the end, he was betrayed by his wife and friends. He was denied a state funeral, and his name was removed from state buildings. But all over this world, every Sunday, people lift up the name of Jesus, the conquering king. I had a pastor friend named Steve Worth. And Steve died kind of young, had a heart problem. He's a relative of mine. And I went over to Muskegon to the church that he'd pastored, that his funeral was packed. Church was full, the balcony was full, the overflow was full. They talked a little bit about Steve and how he had just a, just a humble pastor, that always pastored kind of a regular church, and had given the life that he had to serve the Lord. And the part that I suppose impressed me the most was when a man walked up to sing and another walked up to play the piano and a woman walked up and got a cello out. And then they sang this song called Give Me Jesus. Maybe you heard it, the lyrics are real simple. Kind of the first verse is, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. And then the next verse is, when I'm alone, and when I'm alone, and when I'm alone, give me Jesus. And then it was so poignant and so powerful to hear him sing. And when I come to die, and when I come to die, and when I come to die, give me Jesus. You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. Jesus is alive. Jesus is real. Jesus is walking among the candlesticks. He's walking in the rock pile too. I like to listen to a podcast called The Land and the Book. And if you're smart you will listen to The Land and the Book. Every Saturday morning from Moody Bible Institute is The Land and the Book podcast. It, it's, it's, it's what's happening in the land of Israel. Three weeks ago, I was driving to the men's prayer breakfast or to the elders' prayer meeting. I was listening to The Land and the Book as my car was knifing through the dark. And Tom Doyle was a guest. Tom and his wife, Joyce, travel in the Middle East. And he writes books where he collects stories of what God is doing among the people of the Middle East these days. And the, and the moderator said, Tom, tell us his story about how God is at work in the Middle East. And Tom said, well, let me tell you this story. There was a little boy in a Syrian family. Maybe you remember there was a picture of a Syrian refugee, little baby, little two or three-year-old baby boy face down on the shore that had died. And the, ca that picture captured the attention of the world of the plight of the Syrian refugees. Well, there was another family. And they had this little boy named Ali, and he was so traumatized by the war and by the bombs, he never had spoken a word. And the family knew they needed to get out of Syria, and they needed to find a place somewhere where it was safe. They took everything they had, and they cashed it in. And everything they had, they were able to buy a little boat, a little inflatable raft, and one night, under the cover of darkness and the cold, they went out on the Mediterranean in that raft with their little Ali, their little wordless boy. They made their way out into the ocean, and they were overcome by a ship in the night, a huge light. They tried to paddle away, but they couldn't, and their, the raft flipped, and they were, all flipped, they were all thrown off into the water, and they were floundering for their life. And a fisherman heard them. He heard their cries in the night. He came over in the night with his boat, and he, he got... The mom and the dad out of the water, but they were disconsolate. They're weeping. Where's our baby? Where's our boy? He said, is that him? And they looked back, and there was Ollie sitting in the boat. And they said, Ollie, how did that happen? And for the first time, little Ollie spoke, and he said, a man came along named Jesus, and he lifted me up out of the water. And he smiled at me. When they heard that story, they said, that just can't be true. That's too amazing. And they went to the village with, the, there were 50 Syrian pastors. They said, no, little Ali goes from village to village and he talks about Jesus who lifted him up out of the water and who smiled at him. Jesus is alive. He's walking among the candlesticks. He's walking among the rocks. He's in your life. 
Don't ever doubt it. Let's stand together. We'll dismiss in song. I'll come back, we'll pray, and we'll have our business meeting.